So welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to this future tense uh, conversation on disruptive innovation and specifically on how large and complex organizations adapt to change. I'm Anne-Marie Slaughter. I'm the CEO of New America, and I will introduce uh, our panelists or really our conversationalists uh, shortly. I do wanna just tell you that Future Tense is itself a innovative collaboration between Arizona State University, ASU, Slate, uh, and New America and it explores the impact of technology uh, on society. Uh, and so we, in fact, this, this collaboration has brought all sorts of interesting uh, and innovative programming. Bef uh, we will be talking for about 40 minutes uh, and then I will turn it over to all of you and we will take your questions. So we have two fabulous people to talk about innovation in large and complex organizations universities and railroads, which I think it's fair to say when people say innovation, those are not uh, the images that jump to mind. I, I say that having taught in universities for 20 years, uh, and I am also an Amtrak rider. And so innovation is pretty much the last thing I think of uh, when I think of railroads. Uh, but really, that's the point of today's conversation, because particularly in the United States, but I think globally, when you talk about disruptive innovation, people think Silicon Valley or Silicon Alley or Silicon something. They think about uh, new technologies, information technologies, biotech. Uh, they don't think about what it takes to disrupt, and the disruption part is as important as the innovation part, to disrupt and to innovate in really big organizations. And yet without that, we are not actually gonna be an innovative society. So our, our discussants are uh, Dr. Michael Crow, uh, who is, he became the 16th president of ASU uh, in July, 2002, almost 20 years there, uh, Michael. Uh, and he has revolutionized ASU. Uh, there are no adjectives to describe the full impact of the change that he has wrought. Uh, and he'll talk about that, so I won't steal his thunder. Before that, he was executive vice president at Columbia University, and he was a professor of science and technology policy uh, in the School of Public and International Affairs. And that's important because Michael has studied innovation as a scholar, uh, as well as, as an educational leader. And our second discussant uh, is Lance M. Fritz, uh, who is the chairman, president, and CEO of Union Pacific Railroad. So note, we are not talking about passenger trains. <laughs> I, will, I can't wait to hear uh, more about, about this kind of innovation uh, for Union Pacific. So he also joined Union Pacific uh, in the year 2000. I think that's interesting to be just right off the bat. This, it takes a long time <laughs> to innovate in these organizations. So these are both leaders who've been there almost two, two decades. Uh, and he was COO, Executive VP uh, of Operations and VP of Labor Operations. Uh, before joining Union Pacific, he worked for Fiskars Inc., Cooper, in Cooper Industries and General Electric. Uh, and both he and Michael serve on all sorts of boards uh, and have had lots of outside experience. But rather than going through their CVs, I want to start by asking both of you just to, to start off, talk about the organization you found <laughs> when you came in and give us a, just set the scene for us, you know, and Lance, I'll start with you. What was Union Pacific like in 2000? What did you encounter and what did you immediately think of in terms of, of needing innovation? Yes, thank you very much, Anne-Marie, and thank you for having me here today. Uh, so let's go back to 2000. One of the things that's striking and unique about Union Pacific is uh, our, our age and what we mean to the United States economy. And so when I landed at UP, it was a company that was about 140 years old at the time. Uh, we were signed into existence by President Abraham Lincoln in 1862 as part of the Pacific Railway Act. And we were extremely proud of what we did for the U.S. economy. You know, we, 
We operate in 23 Western states. We serve about 7,300 communities. And even back then, uh, we were talking about how we build America. We connect the communities that we serve, the businesses that we serve to each other and to the world. And we play a pretty vital role. Uh, railroads in the United States ship about 40% of the freight between cities. And we account for less than 1% of the greenhouse gas emissions. So you roll that all together. There was a couple of other things though that, that needed a little uh, changing. One was we are very insular and as a company at, at that time. Uh, we did a lot of promote from within. We did a lot of invent here did a lot of our own writing of software, of applications. And as a result, uh, a lot of our thinking started inside the railroad and looked outward. Hmm. And of course, that's not the best way to, to create an innovation engine. So that's, uh, that was the lay of the land. I, I found a team that was just outstanding in terms of their pride, working together, uh, looking for ways to be better but also one that, that uh, was inwardly focused, uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, born locally uh, in terms of the ideation and uh, uh, knew that we played a big role, but uh, we could play an even bigger role as we improved. And how many employees were there? About 50,000 employees when I first joined the company. Okay, so that, that's, that's my definition of big organization, <laughs> just setting the scene. All right, so Michael, ASU definitely does not go back to 1862. Uh, so we, you're starting from a different place, but you also, I'd like you just to describe the ASU you found. And I should have said in introducing you, you are the one who transformed ASU into the new American university. And I say that obviously as CEO of New America, because that was really part of our original partnership was that you had a new vision uh, of the American university and one that, that uh, is very consistent with our desire for kind of big innovation in the country as a whole. So tell us what it was like. You're on mute. Yeah. Thanks, Anne-Marie, and uh, thanks uh, for the chance to be here. I, I guess where I'll start was, you know, like Union Pacific, we are we are an older institution. We were a territorial teachers academy for the territory of Arizona, established in 1885. And then because of politics and all kinds of other things in Arizona, we didn't become a university until roughly 1960, but only by public plebiscite, meaning it was overruling the legislature, the governor and the board of regents by public vote. The university was named a university name only in 1960. So I come 42 years later and the model that they had worked for those 42 years to implement between 1960 and 2002 was the classic public agency model for a university, public bureaucracy model, very fixed in the public university model, uh, very much buying into the sociology of the day, very much buying into the structure. We had uh, this separation of research elite universities from uh, egalitarian accessible universities and so uh, 2002 found us with uh, a low graduation rate, uh, insufficient diversity, uh, basically attempting to implement the old archaic 19th and 20th century model, which long ago has faded. I mean, it's worth noting that, you know, uh, the more than half the people that go to college in the United States never graduate with any kind of degree. More than half the people that have used the three quarters of a trillion dollars for Pell Grants have no degrees whatsoever because we, our, our model had failed. And it was clear to me before coming that the model had failed and we needed a new model. We'll talk a little bit about that. But the structure that was inherited here operated as a public bureaucracy. My predecessor was uh, very successful at optimizing that old model, but the old model itself was uh, completely inadequate to the assignment and needed to be completely reconstructed, uh, particularly at this interface of public bureaucracy versus what we now call public uh, uh, enterprise. And so we, we took the logic of how do you build enterprises that serve the public, but do not have to operate as a bureaucracy or be only paid for by taxpayers that can be more entrepreneurial, more innovative, more adaptive, faster, quicker, all those things. And so all those things were missing. Uh, there, was, there was no speed. There was no uh, community-centric culture. The culture was faculty-centric. So we had to focus on, I'll, I'll end here, culture change. We had to focus on uh, structural change. We had to find a way to adopt and use technology, which was 
and uh, anachronistic to the evolution of the institution. And then uh, I think really most importantly, we had to go into design mode. So in universities, everyone thinks that the design is isomorphic replication of what someone else has done before you. So all ASU has to do is to try to be UC Berkeley or all, all your school Princeton has to do is strive someday to be as great as Harvard, you know, whatever the, whatever the, the object of adoration is or the object of, of uh, replication. And that's a terrible, terrible, terrible model. So we had to first blow all of that up. Wow. So we've got, we've got lots of uh, kind of ingredients for disruptive change already. And, and Michael, I'll just emphasize your point about optimizing the existing model, which is, it, yes, there, that, that is stewardship. It can be innovation, but it's going to be small innovation and actually disrupting and creating a new model and, and what you have to do. So Lance, let me come back to you. I, I'm thinking you know, both of you had a fixed plant. I mean, you, you have rails and they go places and presumably you can't just blow them up and uh, run new rails. Uh, so you have some fixed elements. You've also got 50,000 people. That's a lot of people and you can't just kind of go in, even if you, if you could or you don't want to, uh, you know, develop a new workforce, it would take a long time. So how do you think about a new model within the parameters of what is fixed? And how in particular do you, do, do you change that culture? Because as Michael said, and you've said that that culture of, you said before it was you know, inside out, how do you open it up to constantly thinking and changing? Yeah, well, Michael, when Michael was speaking about transformation and getting into design mode and not optimizing the old model, but finding your model, the one that works for you for the next whatever period of time. That, that's absolutely spoke to me. We've just gone through that uh, iteratively. And so for a railroad, the fundamental business question is a gigantic linear program, right? You've got for Union Pacific, 8 million or 9 million cars that wanna go from where they are to where the customer wants them because they need something moved there. And you need to do that by you know, optimizing on your resources, making sure you hit a schedule that works for your customers, uh, utilizing the existing footprint to the maximum extent possible, et cetera, et cetera. So what we had been doing up till about a handful of years ago was maximizing the old model, which, which was, um, a, a lot of discrete products within that one big network. It was very complex to execute, very hard for our field leadership team to do repeatedly well. And as a result, our service product was you know, pretty good. We had beautiful white glove service to the customer, facing the customer, but we weren't always doing what we said we were going to do for the customer. And we blew that model up uh, and iterated a new design that worked for us. And, and the core principles of doing that were one, we, we had to streamline the organization and push the decision-making down deeper to where the work and the expertise resided. Two, you had to both put the accountability there, but also enable it. So when we created the new design, instead of having two dozen really smart people in the headquarters building, build a network model, we asked a uh, hundred, hundreds of people from the field to come in and with the express need, you're gonna design the transportation model. We've got the experts that can help you figure it out, but your job is don't touch cars unless you had to, move them as deep into the network as you possibly can Make sure it's a plan that you can execute on your average day with your average team so that our, our service product is very consistent and reliable. So by pushing the work there, by having the experts build out their own model and be supported by people who know how to uh, you know, connect all the moving parts, we've removed about a third of the work that we were doing, all of our service product numbers have improved. Our efficiency has improved dramatically. Now we've, we've drug our team through a keyhole 
but on the backside of it, they're winning. And uh, we were super transparent about the process. It was very painful to the large group of the team uh, because I don't think anybody runs to change. All right? I mean, it's a, it's a rare human that goes against, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of years of evolution and runs to put more energy in and runs to the challenge. Most, most people just want to go away. And, and we've, we've kind of really helped our team understand uh, the challenge is never going to go away. And, and so let's just be transparent, build a foundation of trust, and uh, be clear on what the challenge is and hold hands as we're going to go after it and have a little grace with each other. I love that. Um, and I want to come back to, to talk about how you create that culture, because I do think one thing all three of us share, and I, I gen, I'm definitely a leader I'm much more interested in leading in a transformative way than a stewardship way. I, I, that, what excites me is building things and changing things. But we often find then we are, we are those rare people who run toward change. We love change. Most people are not like that. So I wanna come back on culture, but let me ask Michael to jump in. I mean, is the same idea. You blew up the model, uh, but you blew it up within a, an existing university that had students, that had faculty, that had departments, that had disciplines. Uh, and so talk about how you did that at ASU and to what extent you use the same frame that, that, or, or process that Lance just described of decentralization, which we've often heard, right? That's what Toyota did ages ago, right? They bring everybody from the floor uh, to say, hey, you're the ones closest to what's actually happening. You help us design where, what we should be doing. But that's not so easy to do in a university. So Michael, talk yeah, about I mean, it. <clears throat> yeah, there's some, there's some similarities. I mean, so basically uh, the, the technique was to recognize first that we were a marginal operational success and a failed social enterprise. And so we used basically the argument that, uh, well, we could sit here continuing to operate the way that we are and have less impact than we really ought to, or we could transform the institution. So, so uh, basically what was done was that a proposal was made about how we could improve our social impact. This was then the, uh, what eventually became our charter, which was our new reason for existence. Uh, which was an institution built around inclusion versus exclusion and the measured success of the student, an institution which would do research to benefit the public as a measure, measured outcome, and an institution which would take responsibility for the outcome of the communities that we serve, social, economic, health and well-being, and cultural evolutionary outcomes. Now, once you change that model inside a university, you've altered its purpose. You move away from being faculty-centric to student-centric. You move away from being internally focused to being community-focused. And these might sound like minor things, they're not. Uh, and so we, we completely <laughs> altered the, the cultural paradigm. And then within the institution, you know, we have 5,600 faculty members and 30,000 employees. Uh, we, uh, then uh, we had only 40,000 degree-seeking students. Now we have 150,000 degree-seeking students. So we have almost four times as many degree seeking students as we had and almost 10 times the diversity that we had uh, in, in our student body. And so all of that comes from then being willing to basically attack the status quo, but not just attack it, just to disrupt it. It has to be simultaneously replaced. I mean, the simultaneity of the replacement has to be instant. Uh, and so you do that in our particular case uh, by driving down the idea that you as a faculty member, you as a chair of a department, you as the head of a school or a college are a, an, an architect. You're not a bureaucratic actor. You're a designer of what you're doing to help attain this set of objectives that we've outlined. And so it was empowerment of our actors as designers. That then has led to 40 new departments and schools, you know, uh, a whole new designs of things, 85 departments. Most universities have never eliminated a department. We've eliminated 85 departments uh, and, and, and built and constructed new things. And so the key here, I guess, to the listeners is it's culture change driven by design empowerment uh, with measurements of success that are understandable uh, uh, to the entire organization. And so those are really the things that we, that we focused on in a very complicated place. Uh, uh, our employees are a little bit different than some of Lance's employees, 
in the sense that you know we have 2,100 employees that have a lifetime contract with the institution. We have we have we have uh, uh, lot, high degrees of independent operating within the institution. Yet, nonetheless, you still have to drive innovation, or the institution would continue to fail at its social objective, which we were failing at at that point. Hey, uh, Anne Marie, I want to make one observation. I was going to ask uh, you to respond. <laughs> well, that, that simultaneity of having to reinvent without a hard stop, a pause, and then an implementation is, Michael, that's exactly like running a railroad, right? The, the railroad never stops. There's never a day where freight on the railroad doesn't want to go from where it is to where our customers would like it to be. So you don't have the luxury of shutting the doors, figuring it out, and then firing it back up. You, you've got to land the plane while you're designing the plane. And, and that's a unique challenge. There's not a ton of industry that's like that, like your school. Yeah, we're, 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 we, we found that in the pandemic. So people say, people say to me, well, how has it been being closed? I'm like, we haven't been closed for one second. <laughs> we haven't been closed for one day. I've been sitting here in my office for one year to the day today. Uh, one year ago was the was the last day that I traveled anywhere, and and in, in I've been in the office for one year. So the institution has been has been moving forward every single second of every day because that's the only way we can operate. Like you, we're a twenty four seven organization. I mean, literally mm -hmm. a twenty four seven organization. So that is fascinating, and I have to say I'm taking active notes uh, just just as a leader myself. This this kind of constant transformation. But Lance, I want to I want to focus something Michael said because he started with an institution that he was able to say, "Look, we're failing. You know where we are. We're marginal operationally, and we're a failed social enterprise." No one ever likes to hear that, but in my experience, it is easier to change a place where people know they're at the bottom of a ranking or they're just not really uh, doing what they should be doing. It doesn't sound like that was the situation at Union Pacific, however. I mean, it's often hard to convince people they need to change because they think, well, we're doing fine. We're, we may not be the best, but we're not the worst and we're, we're good at what we do. How did you convince people at, at UP that they needed to change? I, I, I very simply harnessed our desire to be the best. Mm -hmm. so, so if you go back, if Abraham Lincoln is the creator of your company, meh, doesn't really cut it, right? If we're one of the largest, we, we think perhaps the largest freight railroad in North America, performing at a meh level doesn't really get the job done. We, we had, in the old operating model, we had been a tremendous success from the perspective of our shareholders, um, maybe some number of our stakeholders. We had we had improved our operating margin by 2,700 basis points over the course of about 13, 14, 15 years. That's kind of unheard of in industrial America. But for about three years prior to this very significant transformation, we'd been treading water, right? We'd, we'd essentially reached a plateau. And I would go out and visit our, our employees in the field who are, who are on the front lines of creating the value and I would never come away from one of those visits thinking, but for a smarter team or a harder working team, we'd be hitting the, the objectives I, that we should be. I'd, I'd come away going, you know, that's a great team. They're working their ass off. And yet something's getting in the way. And candidly, it took me a while to figure out it was our plan. It was to Michael's point, the fact that we were managing looking backwards at last year's model instead of really challenging ourselves to think, hey, if, if we want to be the best, running the railroad the old way isn't how it's going to happen. So what do we got to do? And, and we kind of opened our eyes to what the model needed to look like and, and changed ourselves. It was just harnessing what was already there, but giving it a name. Ah, so then that's important. So I'm going to ask you both about the biggest obstacles. Uh, but Michael, before I do, and, and actually Lance just, just opened this question, you have had to invent a new, 
a new vocabulary, a new concept. I mean, you, you talk about ASU as a knowledge enterprise, as a public value university. I am very sympathetic to this because I run a think tank that isn't a think tank. It's something else. It's a public problem solving organization, but I don't have a vocabulary for that so that people then default to a university railroad, whereas you are really bringing something into being as, as you both said, uh, running it. So talk a little bit about the that conceptual part, the vocabulary part, the, the way that you convince people they're, they're in a new space. Yeah, so we spend a lot of time actually looking at uh, philosophical underpinnings, uh, drawing heavily from the philosophy of John Dewey or Richard Rorty or other of the American pragmatists, you know, and truly American philosophical techniques and tools and ideas and then underlying or, or and then on top of that moving into the design of the university the purpose of the university so we use logic and rhetoric and philosophy as an underpinning basis for the argument because we have to do that in the world that we live in or you get wiped out uh, and then and then i think that the uh the, the other thing that we've decided and this has been hard because you know, we, you know, people in academia, as you know, think that big is bad. They think that they, they think that if you don't admit only students with A plus averages from high schools, then you're a weaker institution when in fact, you're, you're more of a democratic institution in that sense, uh, uh, if you have a broader set of students coming in. So what we've had to do is come up with very, very strong measurements of success against social goals, mm -hmm. against individual goals. So it's highly goal oriented. Uh, I think that we've also, you know, all turned into a little bit of Cicero, uh, and that is just to suggest that we criticize by what we create. And so, well, there it is. There's our, there's our comment. It's what we did. Uh, and so, you know, we are producing, we do have the largest engineering school in the United States right now with 25,000 students. And 10 years ago, we had 6,000 students in engineering. We have thousands and thousands and thousands of more women in engineering and thousands and thousands of more minority students in engineering than we did, and we're graduating them uh, uh, into the open marketplace with the same market outcome as UCLA or Texas or Columbia or, or any other school in the country, including MIT, in terms of how our engineers do. It's just now that we're graduating thousands and thousands of them, because this notion uh, that, that you, know, you have to be small and elite, that's built around the original design of the small colleges in Oxford and Cambridge. I mean, that's where that comes from. Plato's Academy in Athens, I mean, or academia, you know, that, 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 that's where that comes from. And it's just, it's not, it's okay. There's nothing wrong with it. But if we have to do that, we're never going to be able to achieve our social outcomes or our social objectives. So to your question, at some point, what we try to do is we try to basically say, you know, we're producing, we're producing uh, from a very diverse population of students, from a very diverse faculty at a, at a, at a large, diverse institution, we're producing, you know, a, a, a democratically derived student body of uh, uh, equal potential as the graduates of any other college, because somebody has to figure out how to do this. And so you got to give up a little bit on, on getting beat up. We get beat up constantly. I mean, constantly just beaten, beaten black and blue over, you know, uh, how can you do this? How can you possibly do this? We had a, we had a reviewer here in the accreditation of our university that, that alluded to the fact that we were making up data. And I'm like, oh, well, dude, I don't know what it's like in Ann Arbor, but at least over here in Phoenix, you know, you start talking like that. That sounds a lot like, you know, calling us a liar. Uh, and so so then we overwhelmed him with data and facts and so forth and so on. And he backed up and said, I'm sorry, I didn't understand. And I'm saying, yeah, you didn't understand. And you went ahead and mouthed off anyway. And so and so uh, that that's a bad thing to do. So so we also use huge amounts of data huge amounts of analysis and we're driven by a philosophical driver, which is what would a people's university look like in the democracy called the United States of America, uh, which was accessible and, and committed to the success of, you know what I mean when I say this, our economic democracy. Uh, and, and, so, and so we're one of those institutions and we measure so ourselves against that goal. So I note that both of you I have created this long arc of history, right? Both of you, I mean, Lance, you said, you know, when you were created by Abraham Lincoln, meh, won't do it. Uh, and Michael, you're talking about going back to the entire history of, of not only ASU, but, but of, of universities. And that's part of raising people's sights, right? It's part of giving them the sense of the arc of history. 
So Lance, I'd love for you just to respond to anything uh, in what Michael just said that resonates, but also then shift to what are the biggest obstacles you've encountered? Uh, that, and maybe those, that those obstacles that you think are more generalizable because we all have our very specific obstacles, individuals or, or you know, politics. Yeah, so I recognize a lot of what we do in what Michael was saying, maybe with the exception of uh, studying philosophy as the underpinning of the strategy. But, but uh, to Michael's exact point, we have touchstones that we go back constantly to verify that we're doing what we said we were going to do and that what we said we were going to do is still relevant. And some of it hasn't changed in a long, long time. Uh, to your to your point about how do you make what you do matter to every employee? We build America. Who doesn't want to do that? We say that we connect 7,300 communities, the communities and businesses that we serve to each other and to the world. Who doesn't want to be a connector like that? And we talk about our values, right? We have a passion for performance, which means we want to win with our customers. Very high ethical standards, which means how we do it matters as much as what we do. And that we work as a team. The, the, the railroad's a very unique place, not dissimilar to Michael's institution. It's one very big asset that's used for a lot of different purposes. We have 10,000 customers and, and they run the gamut in the US economy. And the one asset has to serve them. So anytime we're thinking about our sat strategy, you know. It's founded in serve operational excellence. We want to grow with our customers. We want to win and we want to do that together. And each one of those, I can peel out uh, strategic action work streams with KPIs and measurements that aren't made up. They're mainstream to the business. So that, that, that what Michael was talking about very much can be reflected in our approach to purpose and mission, uh, the overall values, the, the stakeholders that we're serving. So let's talk a little bit about your question about what are the big kind of roadblocks, the, uh, the impediments to the kind of change we're talking about. Well, one is, to, and Michael uh, discussed this earlier as well, you can manage last year's model well and convince yourself that you're winning. If, if you narrow down your focus on statistics that measure, did I incrementally get better than last year or sustain a high level of performance based on the old business model, if that's true, that's winning. And it might have nothing to do with what your overall mission is and advancing the mission, or in my world, creating real long-term value for all of your stakeholders. So you know, last year's success can be a real impediment to next year's, uh, what you have to do. Uh, the simple fact that humans generally are wired up not to run to change, right? That we, I, I've read a, a fair amount about uh, uh, how humans view change as, as risk and a threat. And then we go on to fight or flight and, and it's all about energy expenditure and our history tells us the less energy you expend, the greater opportunity you have for survival. So don't do that, right? So there's, there's this deep seated innate, don't make me do anything, right? Just let me do what I know what to do. And, and that's an impediment. But I, I find that the ways to overcome that, to your point, are make the argument so compelling that the difference between current state and future state is is just untenable. It's unacceptable for the average, the, the, the majority of your employees. And then also help them understand, okay. Oops. We're in this together. I don't know the promised land beats the snot out of today. And I promise you we're <laughs> gonna get there. I know we're gonna get there. And then you just are very transparent about every day. It's one step at a time. And today's step, can be celebrated. It doesn't get you to the end, but you recognize, hey, that's a step and it took something and we did it. Then you wake up three years later and you're like, man, you know, the world is better. We are, we can do this. And it starts becoming a little bit more of a, a flywheel for yeah. lack of a better word. 
That's very, so Michael, I'm gonna ask you about uh, your obstacles as well, but I'm gonna say to the audience that we're getting close to turning to your questions. So if you have questions, send them in and uh, I will be looking at them shortly. Yeah, so Michael, I, I, you haven't I, had any obstacles. I know that no, 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 no obstacles. I'm, I'm no obstacles. None. The academia is that these are the safest jobs in the world over here, and so, and so, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll list some. None of them will be surprising. But the first one I would say is, most of academia is trapped in a, uh, uh, you know, what what uh, bureaucratic theorists would call a, a petty or petite bureaucracy model, of conservers who argue against each other, exchanging small political. Uh, combat uh, uh, regimens with each other, and and it just is all consuming, and so this small model, this bureaucratic model, is not the way that intellectual enterprises should ultimately be run, in my view. So that was a huge barrier to change, and I think we've gone a long way to changing that. Second, there is a fear in academia of too much change, uh, just as there is in religion and other areas. You know, where well, how much further out ahead of the of the of the of the body of knowledge or the philo philosophical foundation can we go? Uh, and I'm like, well, just look back in history and be thankful for the people that took these leaps on which your entire existence is premised. Uh, you, know, you know, we're 400 years into the enlightenment and it's hopefully another 400 years or more ahead of us in this enlightenment leading to the second enlightenment. And so don't give up now thinking that we need to change. And so you have those conversations. And then there is a, a third part of this, which is a barrier to change is this selfish focus of the faculty. The yeah. university, the universities are not built for the faculty, but they think that they are, mm -hmm. at least not the public universities. The public universities are built for the citizens. The faculty are the mechanism. They're the public servants, uh, you know, who are supposed to drive the society forward. And then the last uh, barrier to change that I'll list is, um, this is one I'm still working on, which is the resistance to public enterprise. That is, enterprise means entrepreneurism. It means generation, self-generation of resources. It means taking risks, it means uh, failure. Uh, and when the entire system was built on being funded by the state. So when I got here, uh, I've, we've increased our operating budget by over a factor of five. Uh, and, uh, and we've lowered our reliance on state investment in the institution to less than 8% of our operating uh, budget. And that's without a hospital. Uh, and so we're generating billions and billions and billions of dollars a year by competing uh, and that competition then has put us into a position where that's the means by which we advance. And that is a logic which is absent from the ultra wealthy private universities, which are built on endowments and, and high tuition models and uh, heavily supported, uh, publicly supported public universities. And so uh, it, it's just, it's, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a barrier to get people to realize that the only people responsible for our fate is us. That's that that's it's really hard to get people that are at public institutions to realize that. Well, so that leads perfectly into our first question. And I think there, there are many people who think that public enterprise is an oxymoron, right? That that you it's an antithetical to that spirit of enterprise, of trying things, of failing. Uh, the public stands, as you say, for bureaucracy for other things, but that's not necessarily true. What well, is they, true? They, yeah, they, ahead, they, they, they may have never heard of things like the Tennessee Valley Authority or the Bonneville Power Authority, or they may have never heard of the Salt River Project out here in Arizona or innumerable, un, the, the Heathrow Airport, innumerable public enterprises that are highly entrepreneurial. Parts of Heathrow. Yeah, parts of Heathrow. <laughs> the new terminal. But uh, so actually our first question though goes directly uh, to the relationship with government. So the one thing that most tech firms don't have or have much less of than both railroads and universities have are major government stakeholders that the government depends on you doing these things or directly funds you. So how does the role of government oversight play into the innovation challenge uh, and can it actually also be a facilitator? And Lance, I'll start with you. Yeah, uh, absolutely it can be a facilitator and the railroad industry is an embodiment of that. Now, let me get it straight though, for all of our listeners, uh, US freight railroads are self-funded. Um, our in Union Pacific, our uh, revenue base is about $20 billion. We invest about 3 billion in capital a year 
from that 20 billion. We own our own right of way and, and we, we maintain our own right of way. It's, it's a wonderful business model for, for the US economy. We don't rely on the federal government for a dime to do that. Having said that, we are pretty heavily regulated uh, both from the safety side and on the commerce side. And we have a great relationship with our regulators. Uh, it's not always perfect, but they can be helpful in innovation. As sometimes uh, we get an argument where they're an impediment. Uh, if you're a 159 year old company, uh, there's a lot of regulation that was invented a long time ago that just gets carried forward. And you have to help your regulator understand that replacing it with something that reflects the capability of technology today and into the future makes a lot of sense. But to the extent that we invest in that relationship and help that understanding, we have regulators that, that come along. Um, we, we also have good partners when it comes to safety innovation, because uh, the intent is ever improving levels of safety. We're already a very safe industry, but we're not perfect. We're not at a, a zero incident environment. And I think we can get there. So we're constantly working those issues as well. So, so I would say, Anne-Marie, that in the, in the on the ground reality, just like in most every relationship in life, it's all about how uh, much do you put into it? How much do you listen? How much do you try to find common ground with your regulator so that on the backside, you can have enabling uh, conversation and regulation as opposed to disabling. We're nowhere near perfect. There's a long path in front of us on that, but but I wouldn't say it's all on one side or the other. Hmm, interesting. Um, so Michael, you have uh, relations with government at the state and federal level, and frankly, at the international or foreign government level as well. So how, how do you how do you answer the question in terms of the difference it makes and whether it can be an enabler? Yeah, so we have, we have four academic campuses and research campuses in Metro Phoenix. We have five innovation campuses in Metro Phoenix. We have a new, we have a center in Washington that you're familiar with. We have a brand new center that we're opening in downtown Los Angeles this summer in a beautiful renovated uh, Herald Examiner building. We have, uh, we have uh, more than 10 international partnerships that have physicality to them around the world. So we've got all that going on. So we are dealing with governments on all those levels. And, and what we've worked really hard and made a lot of progress on is moving the government away from the notion that somehow they are a watchful overseer of the managerial functions of the institution, like what color is the paint in boiler 62, uh, you know, in building 297, uh, because, you know, and, and really tried to move all of them to the notion of uh, what goals would you like us to achieve? And so, so we were established by the people to serve the people. So the people that are appointed to oversee us, we ask them, what would you like us to achieve? We will worry about how to fund the university. We will worry about how to advance the university. You will make sure that we stay on that, ta that track. We will make sure that the university is kept at the lowest possible price for people from Arizona to maintain accessibility and so forth and so on. But, and so we've really moved to this notion of objectives. Uh, and, uh, and so I think we have a very dynamic and, and very constructive relationship with uh, the government at all levels. Uh, you know, in the new campus we built in downtown Phoenix with significant investment by the city of Phoenix, you know, the objective was to, 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 to help evolve the success of Phoenix as the fifth largest city in the United States. And we have measurements of progress towards those objectives. Uh, in a new, a new campus that we're building in downtown Mesa, Arizona, a, a suburb of Phoenix of more than 500,000 people that most people have never heard of that's got a whole new life and a whole new vigor. And it's bigger than St. Louis and about the same size as Boston. You know, we're building a world-class uh, uh, technology center for uh, unbelievable digital design, digital creativity. And we just launched as a part of that, the Sydney Portier New American Film School, which will operate in Phoenix, Mesa, Arizona, and Los Angeles in these fabulous facilities. But those are, the, those are public investments in infrastructure that, that the expectation is not, you know, did you follow the rules to build the building in the right way? It's did you create a dynamic change in the trajectory of, of Arizona, in the trajectory of downtown Mesa, 
in the trajectory of the lives of the people that you're touching. And so we, what we've done is we've just changed the whole, you know, what is a goalpost? The goalpost is not oversight through functional review of every transaction. The goalpost is oversight through the establishment and attainment of objectives. So that also leads into a, perfectly into another question. Although Lance, I got to tell you, you've got some real railroad buffs in this audience. There's a bunch of questions coming in. That Sheldon, <laughs> Sheldon Cooper must be watching off the Big Bang Theory. I'm, I'm trying to choose those that will have maybe a little broader application, but I'm learning all sorts of things. Um, but so one question that goes, I think, exactly uh, to something you both talked about is, does major innovation always require a basket of new metrics and, and performance indicators? And if so, how do you decide on what those are? Because you're changing, you're, you're coming up with something uh, new. So what they are and where they should be. And Lance, let me go back to you, but because both of you did say you develop new metrics. Is that necessary? Anne-Marie, I would say our experience is new metrics almost always uh, are birthed from a fundamental change process or, or a, a business process that's been fundamentally changed. However, I wouldn't say that we necessarily start there every time. Sometimes we do, uh, but with some frequency, you know, if the, let me put it this way, transforming the railroad from the last way we used to run the, tr the transportation plan to the way we ran it today, we've had some carry forward uh, metrics, a productivity metric like locomotive productivity or fuel consumption rate or uh, a service metric like how do we serve our local customers to and from local industry and we've unveiled and and embraced replacement brand new metrics like the speed of every freight car every day on the railroad or the trip plan compliance for every intermodal box uh, that we ship every day so our, our experience is all metrics don't get thrown out because there's some fundamental metrics that are still reflective of what your customers and markets desire from you. Uh, but because the, the network is transforming and being managed in a different way, we've, we've almost always found there are either additional or new unique uh, mm -hmm. key KPIs, really key success factors that we just didn't measure before because we weren't looking at the we weren't looking at the business model the same way before. Yeah, you know, what, 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 what I would add to this, uh, Anne-Marie, is that for us, it's not new metrics in the notion of like foreign things that didn't exist before. It's new attainment. And so I'll give you an example. So, so you know, after a while, you just get sick of the fact that we're producing a million uh, high school dropouts a year in the United States, uh, most of whom will end up in some kind of uh, need for uh, public assistance across large swaths of their life is they're not prepared for the labor force requirements that lie ahead. And so, so we then say, okay, well then we're going to start K-12 public schools under Arizona's charter clause with public school districts and where every single student is going to graduate and every single student is going to go on to, to a post-secondary opportunity, either at a technical school, a community college or a university or the military. We've done that. We have no dropouts in the schools that we've run for at least four years, none. Uh, and so, so there, that's a new attainment for us. The metric is anything below, below completion is unacceptable. Uh, and so that's a new metric. Uh, uh, it's a new attainment level. Likewise, you know, when we set a 90% retention rate in engineering uh, uh, versus our traditional weed out, look to your left, look to your right, uh, you know, one of you two jokers are not going to be there. Uh, you know, that, that you can't, you can't, you can't, you, you can't be weeding people out and booting them to the curb at age 19 and hoping that that's going to produce a good outcome. Uh, I, the last time I checked, there's a lot of angry people in the United States. And the last time I checked, there's a lot of people that took college debt that don't have jobs capable of paying it back. They're ticked off. Uh, and so one of the things that we have to do is we, you know, we can't be a part of that anymore. Uh, and so it's not, it's not that there's a new metric, there's a new attainment objective relative to our metrics. So, so for instance, we'd like to not be only a white middle-class institution. Okay, well, if you're, not, if you're gonna be something other than a white middle-class institution, then you have metrics, you're, you're moving towards these goals. And so it's, 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 the, it's, it's, 
metrics that you would imagine that we have, um, but with new levels of attainment. And there are some new metrics that we have, and that is since we're funding ourselves, we have to have margins. And then we have to reinvest the margin back in the institution. That's a, that was a foreign concept. To have financial metrics in a university was a foreign concept. Uh, and so that's been a hard one for us to advance, but all the rest are basically new attainment levels of the traditional metrics. Hey, Michael, what I, what I love about what you said there when you said uh, we're looking at educating our engineers in a different way where in the old in the old school, I was an engineer and I remember that lecture, you know, as a freshman, look to your left, look to your right, somebody's going to be gone. What you learn in the business world and in your world, in the in the real world of executing and owning, if you got rid of half your employees every year, you'd be in a world of hurt. Yeah, you, you, you can't you can't take the general population or the population that gets into ASU and then subsequently get half of them booted because you don't know how to teach them. So there's, 30, right? there's, I mean, there's 35 million people in the United States that went to college that have no degree. Yeah, that's, and I guarantee it's, you that the majority of them are not necessarily happy about that fact. No, no, and and that gets that gets back to it's our obligation as leaders to help everyone in the institution get up to speed that you need, and that doesn't mean sprinting every day. That just means getting into the flow of the work that needs to be done, understanding it, being empowered, enabled. If you got to train them, train them. If you got to get out of the way, you get out of the way. Every once in a while, you run across somebody that shouldn't be there, so be it. But that's a pretty rare day. That's very Even rare, and then and then it's so rare that you can have you can really focus a lot of energy on them, and then only very few of them won't make it. So, right. Yes. Well, so it's interesting as you're talking about individuals, you are laying out that same runway, that same sense of possibility uh, that you are for your organizations in terms of how you motivate people. Uh, and how you actually ensure their success. We've got lots more questions and not much more time. I wanna ask one about technology because both of you have talked about uh, how technology has helped you innovate. Uh, and again, I know more about uh, ASU in terms of, of really transforming the idea of what uh, immersive education, uh, physical-based education can be. But also, Lance, I know you've, you've used lots of new technology and safety elsewhere. But are there ways in which technology is a barrier to innovation? Because we typically equate new technology with innovation. But I just want, one of the questions was, what about when that equation, uh, uh, equation does not work? Yeah, so uh, Anne-Marie, presuming you were, you were pointing at me first, I'll, I'll go first. Uh, I, I think innovation can be a barrier, in my experience, if your team starts with, well, it's a technology problem. In my experience, it is almost never a technology problem or, or opportunity. Now, there's a lot of times we're, we're a technology company. We write our own ERP. ERP. We have a massive microservices architected enterprise system that is maybe second only to Netflix uh, that has just been gutted and rewritten over the course of about the last eight years. And, and my new CIO lands here and goes, Lance, you guys are a wonderful platform company. It's awesome. I guarantee our service product isn't better because we rewrote our ERP. Had nothing to do with that. Our service products better because we redesigned the way we run the railroad and oh by the way had a technology that enables it uh, so I, I think technology becomes a bit of a stumbling block if the team gets confused and thinks but for a spend here or a system there or a invention here we'd be a much better institution yeah i i agree with lance on that and that is it gets in the way if it becomes the object of what you're doing so you know we're not a technology manufacturer we're a learning knowledge and academic enterprise that produces people ideas and new gizmos uh technology is this ink pen is a technology it's a yep. funny little joke this ink pen by the way is directly connected to my brain uh by by, by itself it has no functionality whatsoever and it's just a means for me to do things and so we look at technology as a way to project our faculty, a way to connect our faculty. We just look at it as, as air or electricity. 
and, and, and so it, 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 it's, it's nothing but it's air, water, electricity. That's, that's all it is. And, and, and we want it to be uh, uh, ubiquitously available to whatever anyone, anyone needs to do whatever they think they need to do as transparently as possible. And, and, and that's how we view it. So it, it, it would get in the way if all of a sudden we started, in fact, we have to worry about this. Occasionally, we have some projects that become pretty big technology projects, and we don't want them to become the project because that's not the project. That's not why we're here. You know, we're here to enhance learning outcomes across a large spectrum of people. I could talk to you guys all day long, <laughs> uh, but we have got a few more minutes. I'm going to ask you a final question. You've both been in your jobs, as I said at the outset, for almost two or two decades, uh, indeed, uh, Lance, and, and almost two, Michael. So what would you tell or will you tell your successors? You are both transformative leaders. You have created massive innovation. You've, uh, you both said you broke the old model, you created a new one. So now your su successor comes in. Do they come in to steward what you've built or or do they have to keep innovating? And if so, how? So what will you tell your successor? Not that I'm inviting either of you to step down, but I, I think it's an interesting question. Lance, go first. Yeah, sure. Uh, clearly the words out of my mouth will not be, uh, keep doing exactly what I've just done, right? That's, that, that's a losing proposition. I, the, so I've thought a little bit about this and I think the guidance to my successor is going to be, um, give it a little time, look at what you've got, be really clear-eyed about what's coming, be very inclusive in all of that research and thought and conversation. Don't wait too long. And once you've got a pretty clear image of what you think we need to be, be relentless, just be relentless. Make sure you're you're building your cohorts, make sure you're building understanding, but there's not a minute that goes by that you're not working on whatever that is. And uh, I think if we pick right, she's gonna do a hell of a job. <laughs> okay. uh, what, 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 what I would say is uh, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> and, what, and what I mean by that is that, is that uh, in, in, in our sense, uh, by that point, uh, we will have completely uh, moved away from any of the standard managerial training practices of thousands of other colleges or universities. And so the good luck will be good luck and keep the innovation process going. And that, that the institution is in fact an innovation enterprise. That's what we do. Uh, and, and whoever uh, takes over for me uh, will then focus on uh, a, a team leader of an innovation process that's continuous. And, and the good luck part is do not fall back. I mean, the, the, the fear that I have is the retrograde to the rest of the sector, uh, which has not innovated in the same ways. And so innovation has got to continue to move forward. And so that, and then, and then uh, you know, here's my email. <laughs> <laughs> Don't use it too much. <laughs> <laughs> Let me know. <laughs> well. You know, when we started, I said that people don't normally think of disruptive innovation in terms of railroads and universities. They think of this as a uh, Silicon Valley startup conversation, but you have both completely uh, disproved that idea. Uh, as I said, I've been taking notes as a leader myself all the way through, and I, I'm, I'm struck in, in kind of pulling this together because it's impossible to summarize both at the, the, the scale of your vision, but your willingness to go back to the fundamental question of what it is you're trying to do. So you didn't take your institutions as given. You started with the mission. And the mission stays the same to deliver at the high, to deliver for your customers, to, to educate students. Uh, that stays the same, and you both pose it in the largest terms and, and set very high attainment goals. But of course, how you achieve that mission then must change as circumstances change. But you, you focus people on purpose and mission and quality, and then everything else you loosened up to allow for design and natural human creativity. Uh, and it's it's just striking and listening to both of you that I feel inspired by your company's missions 
uh, just as much as I'm impressed at the actual innovation. So it's been a fabulous conversation. I want to thank both of you. Uh, thank the Slate team, uh, the, the Future Tense team, uh, and as always, uh, our fabulous New America events team that makes all this possible. So have a great afternoon. It's wonderful to talk to you both. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.